Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in the Hydration with Heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, today we're refeaturing Casey Marrick, a two-time childhood cancer survivor, nonprofit founder, medical mama to two babies, one born with only half a heart and one on the way. She's embracing life lemons, so to speak. She goes by the handle laughing after lemons on social media. And she's also the founder of KH Kids Inc. She joins me now for a follow-up interview. We last had Casey on over a year ago, back in May of 2023. Today, we're chatting all about Noah's new lease on life and how he's thriving in his new heart, the importance of organ donation and how she balances it all. Welcoming now to the show is the incredible Casey Marrick. Welcome, superstar. Hi, so great to be here again. So great to have you on. So let's do a recap for the new listeners. So for those who may not be familiar with your story, can you remind our audience about your diagnosis and what happened to you at 14 years old? Yes. Um, I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, I was just a normal kid. I had some, you know, skin issues, some other little things going on with health and went to the doctor multiple times and ultimately ended up with a big tumor, um, on my neck. And we went in and was, I was diagnosed with, uh, thyroid cancer, uh, at age 13 was my first diagnosis. Um, went into treatments, had a full removal, and then um, I had a reoccurrence a year later. So um, at the age, I think I, I had just actually turned 15, um, but I've been in remission ever since. And uh, yeah, it's been a, a wild ride. <laughs> God bless. Well, with that cancer diagnosis at such a young age come a lot of repercussions. And looking back over the past decade, you faced many challenges from health issues to starting a family. Can you share what happened at your 23-week-old anatomy scan during your second trimester with Noah? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, living without a thyroid too at such a young age. And I feel like there's just so much research and stuff that's still being done. Um, it changes your entire body. And I was so young when I had cancer and then I knew I was going to, the doctors had prepared me to, that I was going to have reproductive issues. Um, I had multiple miscarriages before Noah. And then when we got pregnant with Noah, we were closely being watched and everything seemed to be perfect. Um, and then we went to our anatomy scan and that's when we got the diagnosis that he only had half of his heart. We were told we should probably terminate. He's likely not going to make it to birth. If he does, uh, his condition is not compatible with life. And there are surgeries that could, could potentially be available to him, um, if he is well enough to do them but he likely won't make it to one year, uh, his first birthday. And so, um, yeah, that's the diagnosis we got at 20 weeks. <laughs> that's hard. Now let's chat facing hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So hypoplastic left heart syndrome is a very serious condition. Can you walk us through the options you were given for Noah's treatment and how you made the decision to move forward with the surgeries? Hypoplastic left heart, you have basically three options. The first one is to terminate. Um, the second one is to go on comfort care when the baby is born, just keeping the baby comfortable. Um, and then the third one is a three stage palliative surgery. And it's not a cure by any means. Your baby still has half a heart, um, but it will at least, it, it attempts to get them to adolescence or adulthood so that they can have a better chance of getting a heart transplant. Honestly, I reached out to a lot of different hospitals that I did a lot of research and then I jumped over to social media and just started researching the hashtag and reaching out to the moms and yeah, just kind of tried to make the best decision with the information that I had at hand, which was really hard because, you know, we, we didn't know what was going to happen when he got here and how bad actually his heart was. Um, but we did ultimately decide to go with the surgeries and, uh, that required us to move a couple hours away to deliver him at a, a hospital that had a program that was able to perform the surgeries. 
and um, I moved at 36 weeks and then we had him um, right at 40 weeks. Wow. So let's chart, let's chat heart transplants in infants. So heart transplants in infants are rare. Can you share any insights or statistics about how common they are and what the waiting process typically involves? It, it, it's very, very difficult to get a heart at, an, at a newborn age, um, which is why they try to get you to an older age with to hypoplastic. Prolong. To right. prolong it, correct. For our situation, you know, through the evaluation process, we went through the transplant evaluation twice. Once when Noah was three months old, because they did not believe he would make it through his second open heart surgery. Um, and so we had to have a backup plan to be in order, in order to list him right away um, for a transplant. So we started the evaluation process. And then the second time obviously was um, in 22 when he was listed for a heart and the evaluation process is very uh, rigorous. <laughs> it's hours of talking to the doctors about the long term, what life will look like post transplant, the side effects. Um, it's about the weight. It's about the um, the medications that you know he'll be on forever. And so Noah was listed, and we were told the waiting process was about six to nine months um, from once you're listed. So can you share, so let's chat about the waiting period for this heart transplant. Um, that must have been incredibly stressful. Yes. Can you share what that period was like for you and, and, and your family and Noah? Yeah. So, so Noah was born again, he was born at another hospital. So he actually underwent three open heart surgeries before being listed for a transplant. And we got him into a state where we could take him home. So we brought him home at 10 months old and he was still in very severe heart failure and uh, was very, very sick and ultimately never qualified for the third surgery that he needed because he was too sick, which led us to waiting for the heart. Um, in order to get a heart, you can be listed at home, uh, but you're listed at a lower status. So it's very rare that you'll get the call. You could be waiting for years. Um, so in order to really be on the top of the list, you have to be admitted inpatient um, on, on a drug called milrinone. And then that puts you into a 1A status. We're picking up Noah's entire life. At that point, he was three when we put him inpatient to wait. Um, he was too sick to stay home and he declined very, very quickly. Um, and time was of the essence, you know, we started really losing hope and we knew the wait was typically six to nine months inpatient and we hadn't even made it a month and Noah was already not wanting to get out of bed, not able to eat anything for weeks. Um, he was really struggling. And so uh, it was just really hard to like remain faithful and positive and be there for him because he's the one going through it and be this like, you know, light and and trying to keep him focused and, and positive uh, when we were also just kind of not sure that it was going to happen in time. Um, so here, so here you are now, your only recourse is a heart. Yeah. No, no surgeries can fix this. You're at the edge. You have, you're out of options and you just need a heart and he's three years old. So let's talk about the importance of organ donation. So there's over, 100,000 people in the U.S. waiting for an organ transplant, maybe more. Uh, many never get the call saying that a suitable donor organ has been found. What would you like to tell people about the importance of organ donation? And talk to me about your donor. Yeah, so um, the importance, there's just so much that we all, I mean, I'm still learning, you know, and we've been in this journey for over a year now. Um anyone can be an organ donor, even if you have past medical issues. So educate yourself, reach out to um, your local, your state organization um, and see if it's an option. I know it's the worst thing that any family also wants to talk about, right? Like we don't want to talk about such a hard, a hard thing to even think about, especially with our children. But, um, you know, it is so important um, to know and to just have that information available 
uh, so that you can make the the right decision uh, if there's ever a time. And it's just changed our life. Like, I mean, Noah wouldn't be here if we didn't have his donor. And that was something that was really hard for me because it's like, how do you pray for a heart to come? Like, you're literally praying for a, a miracle. Yeah, but but on the other side, but yes, a child praying for you know, this child to die. And it was like, never that I never wanted that. It's such a hard thing. Right. Like, and I still think about that all of the time, but, um, there's a lot of, you know, it's such a hard, it's such a a bitter, it's bittersweet. It's bittersweet without a doubt, especially as a mother. So talk to me about your donor. Yeah. So, um, after you get, a transplant of any organ. Um, every state has their requirements of how you'll communicate with the donor recipient. For us, we had to wait a year, um, in order to send a letter. And so at one year we were in the hospital with Noah and I handed over our letter to our team and I really didn't expect to hear back. Cause I know I, I can't even imagine what that family is going through and I knew nothing about them. I don't know, the age, the gender, we knew nothing. And so I handed over the letter on April 1st and about maybe three weeks ago, we were unexpectedly in clinic with Noah and we received the letter back from the family. Um, so I don't know much about them yet. Um, I do know it was a little girl and, um, me and the mother are, expecting to connect soon and hopefully we will travel and meet them. Um, so yeah, we're just kind of waiting. There's a process. So now that we both have agreed to communicate with each other, we are able to, uh, share our contact information. So I have just shared that. Yeah. Do you believe in angels? Yeah, I, I, I definitely do now, you know, no, without, or through all this journey, um, Noah and I talk a lot about, he asks a lot of questions and just a couple months ago, um, I guess it was about two weeks shy of his one year heart anniversary, the day he received his gift. Um, we were talking nothing in particular, but he randomly brought up that there was a little girl in the operating room when he got his heart. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, you don't know who that little girl was? I had no idea. We knew nothing about the donor, the donor family, anything. So we did not know if it was a girl or a boy. Um, And I tried not to ask too many questions because I didn't want to, I just wanted him to organically tell me. Um, but of course I immediately like text my family, text my husband. I'm like, no, I just said there was a little girl when he got his heart, like in the room with him. And it was just so wild. And and then to find out now, you know, months later that it in fact is a little girl. I absolutely believe she is his guardian angel. And, um, I do really believe he saw her, you know, like it's, yeah. Wow. That's wild. That is without a doubt his guardian angel. You should ask him what she looks like. Yeah, I, I've tried. And sometimes he, he's just like, I don't know, you know, he's four. So he's a little spacey, but, um, I'm very curious to hear more about her. Like she, the mother shared some things, you know, and hobbies and Noah's changed so much this last year. And I'm just very curious, like if there are similarities and I'm sure that there are. So I'm sure there are. She lives in him. Wow. Now, what do you want to tell older Noah about his journey and the strength he's shown? Yeah, just, um, he has changed my life. He has changed so many other people's just perspective. You know, he's been through so much and, um, still he's five, he's five he, now. Uh, he'll be five. Yeah. And two, in two weeks. Um, he just, he's so positive and, you know, I, I just, I also want him to know that like, this doesn't define him. Um, his, he can do anything he puts his mind to and 
Yeah. I don't know. I just, I'm very, very proud of him. Oh, so as, as everyone is now, how do you balance being a medical mama to Noah, uh, having a child on the way and, <laughs> uh, and another little one? I mean, you also run a nonprofit and, and maintain your personal well being. How do you do it all? Some days I'm still asking myself that same question. I don't, you know, some days I'm failing at the balance of it all. Um, and I think just trying to take everything day by day, um, you know, with Noah, it's still a lot of appointments. We are in a lot of therapies. We are at the doctor almost every other week with him to check on his heart currently still. So it's a lot. Um, he is fully is this deep. heart. Is this the permanent heart he will have? Um, so heart transplant is on average about, um, if you look at like statistics, five to 15 years, um, until they need another heart. Um, so right now, you know, we just, again, taking it day by day, knowing that in the future, it is very likely he's going to need another transplant, but I'm hoping that technology and science just continues to make strides because they've made so much progress. Yes. And, and, um, yeah, so this will be his heart until, you know. Until God dictates otherwise. Yes, exactly. Now, we are almost out of time. I have two more questions very quickly. Uh, I know back in 2009, you established a nonprofit, um, Casey Helps Kids, KH Kids. What inspired you to start this organization, and how has its mission evolved over the last few years? Yeah, um, going through cancer, you know, I feel like at that time too, we didn't have social media, we didn't have just all of the things that are connecting us. And so I felt very alone at the time. Um, and I actually, for my treatments, had to be in complete isolation for days at a time. So I was 13 in a room with just, you know, live TV. <laughs> um, and my dad had brought me a teddy bear. And I always signified that teddy bear as like, it could be with me when my parents couldn't and nobody else could. And so that's really how Casey Oaks Kids started was I reached out to a teddy bear company and got a massive donation and ultimately ended up partnering with like Build-A-Bear over a couple of years. And we started donating teddy bears to kids in the hospital. And then over the years, it transpired into something much bigger, uh, giving emotional support to children, financial support to their families. Um, we were hosting fashion shows across the nation where kids would get to dress up and be a model for the day. And um, yeah, now we're rolling out some new partnerships and some new programs we're really excited about. So inspiring. You have come full circle. Now, my, my last question, we have about a minute left. Do you have faith in God and how has your faith played a role in your, in your journey? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, I feel like this journey has really made me question a lot. Um, I, I feel like, especially, you know, when I look back at even the time when Noah was in the hospital waiting for his heart, like we were so angry of just like, why, why is our innocent child going through this? You know, you have all of the questions, the anger, the bitterness. And, um, yeah, I, I feel like it's taken us a long time, but we see it now. Right. And I feel like so many times it's like, we're going through something so difficult and so hard. And it's like, why are you doing this? Why, what, what, what did I do to deserve this? Um, but the bigger picture is there, you know? And of course there's so many things we don't understand, but absolutely we have faith and we know that, um, Noah is a blessing and he is a miracle and his donor and their family are such a miracle to us. And we are just very, very thankful for all the things. Oh, Casey, your story is incredibly <laughs> inspiring. I've been holding back tears throughout this entire interview, truly. Um, I am so excited that you came back and reshared positive news and that your family is growing and you have all of these incredible chapters ahead of you. And I know that baby Noah is thriving and he's going to continue to thrive. 
and I, I couldn't be happier for you. Stay blessed. Thank you so much. That was the Hydration with Heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut. That was the amazing Casey Marrick. She goes by the handle Laughing After Lemons. Head directly to their website at laughingafterlemons.com. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A moment of Zen is brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, 100% pure coconut water. Imagine a drink that's nutrient rich, powerfully refreshing, naturally sweet with no added sugars, not from concentrate, zero additives, low in calories, absolutely no artificial flavors, and is so tasty that it will become your new favorite beverage. Enter Once Upon a Coconut, the absolute best tasting coconut water you will ever try. Available in four refreshing flavors pure, chocolate, pineapple, and sparkling with energy. Do your taste buds a favor and pick up some today at onceuponacoconut.com. 